six Trey Van Diggs. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I grew up in Maryland. I played one season of high school football. I've been playing football all my life. I went to Grambling State University. I went to the University of Alabama. I was undrafted. I was a second round draft pick. I have the Cowboys record with 11 interceptions. I have the Cowboys record with 11 interceptions. They're still throwing at me. We heard Trayvon say that last year. Okay, come on, throw it at me. And I think Everson was very much the same. I didn't take it well at first, but I feel like Coach Saban had saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. Yeah, that was a pretty intense game. Ironically, best games I ever played in. Had about like three turnovers. Everson Walls was Trayvon Diggs' biggest cheerleader. He wanted him to break the record. a ton of help from a secondary that leads the NFL in interceptions and Trayvon Diggs is leading the way with 10. He is just one away from tying the Cowboys single season interception mark. Of course, Everson Walls right up there at the top. So that particular uh, game when you tied my record with 11, I ended up uh, having to be legend of the week. Fans, let's take a look at tonight's Cowboys were introducing uh, me that particular game. Uh, they always introduce it uh, right after the first uh, series. Here comes the defenses out. So Prescott back on the bench after they picked up one first down. Little trick play did not work. And here goes Heineke with Antonio Gibson. He and before we even sat down, Heineke comes at you. Toe injury, but he starts at running back. Of play action. Heineke going deep downfield. And interception number 11 for Trayvon Diggs. There's number 11. They didn't just do that, did they? They did that, did they? I mean, I don't know. First of all, no one's expecting that because he's coming at you. It's like they're trying to take your heart right away. Well, I actually knew that they were going to throw it, that play. Just by off how they was lined up, and he was kind of looking at them before the play. Like the sideline was up, everyone was watching on the sideline. It was real intrigued on to like see. I was like, okay, they're coming my way. McLaurin did not have a catch in the game two weeks ago because Diggs shattered him, and Trayvon Diggs, who had that ball all the way, just tied. You know, uh, if I recall, uh, when I beat Mel Renfro's record with 11, it was in Texas Stadium but it was the exact same side of the field. And they tried the exact same route. And it's intercepted by Emerson Wall. That is a new Cowboy interception record set by the rookie free agent who led Greg Wilson. And Mel Renfro just happened to be uh, highlighted that particular game in the stands as well. So he was there to see me do it and I was there to see you do it. That's kind of eerie. Nah, that's dope, yeah. for sure. I think that's the kind of theme of this whole show, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everson Walls, in the span of a very few years, played for Tom Landry, Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, and Nick Saban. That's what I, I don't want to hear any other that you sat on the corner in Detroit, nothing. Magic. It's a it's an impressive list of coaches. Um, Tom Land. Well, we can start off with uh, Eddie Robinson. You know what? We can start off with my old man. My dad was the best coach I ever had. He immediately knew what I need to do to be able to catch the ball. I was complaining about not being able to catch it. He told me what to do. I did it, and it worked. I'm like, whoa, he's amazing. And he always was. He knew athletes. He knew coaching. Go. The technique that he showed me, it followed me throughout my entire career. You could see it in my physicality. Finally, 
I think they've come up with a great cornerback. Through all the years of Dallas excellence, the only great cornerback they had was Renfro. But look at this kid with a nose for the football. And he may be the answer. And he was a free agent. If my dad doesn't teach me how to catch a ball, we're not sitting here right now. I wanted him to make it, you know. He's from right down the street, Hamilton Park. We're right practicing right there. How cool is that? Well, yeah, uh, you know, they're right up the street from Hamilton Park uh, when the Cowboys first had their their facility. Come on, baby. <laughs> but their facility looked like uh, it looked like a, a Hamilton Park gymnasium. I'm sorry. And so, because we were the only black neighborhood on the north side of town, it was very convenient for the black players. Uh, you know, they're trying to find the food, they're trying to get a haircut, things of that nature. So we had all of that uh, in my neighborhood. They would all come down. Uh, Ray Field Wright was a good friend of the family. Jethro Pugh, uh, he would come down every once in a while and hang out in the neighborhood itself. So uh, we were already kind of adopted. Hamilton Park was already adopted by the, the, the African-American Dallas Cowboys. You know, ever so while it was, it was interesting because he wasn't a can't miss prospect. You know, here's a guy who, who you know, wasn't a highly recruited guy. He played basketball as well, though. You know, didn't get, didn't go to football until late, but he had a neck. Uh, he uh, was not the uh, the best student. I just couldn't. I couldn't stay on the, on the team. I kept getting kicked off of teams in high school. Got kicked off the basketball team, kicked off the football team, uh, just based on the environment that was there, you know, with the integration and all of that. And I did not take well uh, to authority figures. I think what really made me uh, realize I needed to make a change when I was sitting in my, uh, in my cell, in, in, in the juvenile home. Uh, that was uh, very traumatic uh, to go through that process, getting in trouble. Uh, just never could, I couldn't get out of my own way. If I wouldn't have figured it out by then, then I was never going to figure out what I need to do with my life because that was probably my lowest point in my life at that time. Uh, then he, he doesn't know where he's going to college and, and, and basically all right, I guess I should go to college. Oh, this girl I'm dating is going to Grambling State. I might as well go there too, right? People of faith believe there, there are not many accidents. And uh, the young Everson Walls who came out of Berkner High School, um, maybe it wasn't the best idea for him to go play for Texas or Arkansas or somebody like that or LSU. Uh, maybe he needed a little bit of Eddie Robinson first. My first memory, um, I remember it was when I was like five, four or five. Uh, I always played with the older kids. Like my dad always had us on the older team. So like I'll always be the youngest person on my team every year. I feel like he did that because he wanted like to build some like toughness, you know? Like if you can play with these guys, you can play with anybody. Yeah, so like when he was four, he saw Steph got to play football and he really wanted to play too. So I remember him taking the equipment, putting the helmet on, and he'd only be like so high. And I'm like, little boy, you cannot play football. But Big A like put him out there anyway and he actually could play with the bigger kids, so. So guys, in my first practice, I remember um, it was uh, hitting drills. And it was just a big kid and we just ran into each other and I ran them over. <laughs> Me and everybody was just excited, like my dad was happy and I feel like that when I really like fell in love with it. It's funny, um, it started out when they was attend elementary school, Trey was like the bigger brother, like Stefan would forget everything. So Trey would be like, um, Stefan, 
he forgot your book bag. And he'd run back home and get his book bag. Stefan, you get your lunch money. So it was like Trey was the bigger brother. And then it kind of switched when my husband passed away. And then Stefan was more, you, you need this. You got your backpack. You got your lunch money. It affected me like a lot. I started like getting in trouble in school and stuff. Just doing stuff that I know I wouldn't have done, you know, if my dad was there because, you know, I had so much free, you know, just to do anything, you know. So I kind of like started getting in trouble and, you know, just doing all the wrong things, you know, because it kind of like affected me at that age. Yeah, that was a very tough time. Trey was really young. So going through that, I saw him like get the understanding, also grieve the loss. But then like we come back and we're like, okay, well, what are we going to do now? I remember the day he passed and uh, the boys were like devastated. My daughter, everybody was crying. And Trey was like, it's okay, it's okay. We just need to stick together. And it was just like, oh my goodness, you know. He was like, we gonna be okay. So, you know, even when he's quiet, he would say things like, just at the right time. Like, it's gonna be, we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay. Yes, Trayvon was in eighth grade, and I was coaching my first coaching position uh, with the Rockville Football League. So my first experience with Trayvon was literally Trayvon ripping and running up and down the field against us. The following year, when they decided to send him to public school, and it just so happened the way things worked out, after that year of youth football, I became the head coach at a local um, high school, which he lived in the district. Um, so it was the best gift that I, a coach could ask for. Early years, you know, I had my brother, but my brother had to focus on what he needed to focus on. He helped me as much as he could, but, you know, I seen Coach Spinner like every day. You know, just him being there kind of helped me out a lot. You know, I could relate to him a lot, you know. So anything, you know, I had questions or, you know, just advice, you know, he was always there to help. So, you know, he played a big, a big role for sure. But when Steph went off to college, obviously he didn't have as much time as normal. That's when my role kind of picked up even more. Now I was taking him to camps. Now I was taking him to Dallas for you to say football. Now I was taking him around the schools for school visits and facilitating conversations with coaches. So I stepped into that role, but always tried to stay behind the scene because it wasn't about me. He could play with the bigger kids. So when he finally went to high school, got that growth spurt, like he barely had to tap into like his talent because he was just already so much better than the other guys. In high school, he played corner, he played receiver. He held the, the field goal. He was the holder for the field goal, but we didn't really have a kicker. So he gets the ball, great snap, and he picks it up. For whatever reason, the defense kind of knew, right? And they're meeting him, and instead of him putting his head down and trying to get across the line, he literally jumps and completely clears the kid. And at that point, I was like, we already knew he was special, but I was like, wow. It, it, that was a play that stands out still to this day because he's playing a position he doesn't normally play. And he's still trying to make an impact on the game. Just creating that winning mindset, just carry over into life and just everything that you want to do. Like, you want to win in all your situations. Like, whatever you're going through, you want to win. So he always had that mindset that no matter what I do, I have to excel. So it wasn't that big of an issue as far as him following in the footsteps of Stefan. Instead, just making a bigger imprint than Stefan did. That was his goal. So. Stefan stayed home and went to Maryland, so now I got to put a bigger imprint in the ground. I'm doing something that a lot of people won't do, and I'm going outside my, my, my comfort zone. I'm going down to Alabama, which is the mecca of college football. Grambling State University. So we had the band, okay, the, the, the human beatbox. We had the, uh, you know, we had, of course, Doug Williams, who was the first uh, black college quarterback going for the Heisman. 
I think our stadium held 3,000 people. And you know, we're not talking AstroTurf, we're talking, we're not even talking grass, yes. We're talking dirt and sand. You know, it was always hot and new, uh, humid and muggy. Uh, I, the sprints, the, the, the calisthenics, everything was before practice. Because Coach Eddie Robinson, he wanted to know how we practice under fatigue. Stay with it. Watch your head, all right? Come on, good. That's staying with it. Just lay right in that with it all the way. It can be a bad block, and you can make it a good block. Hit! Practice. Everything you said, I remember. Like, just the calisthenics, just backpedal drills, like, all your drills you're doing before practice, like, no water. You're doing everything before practice. It's so hot out there, like, before we even get to a walkthrough, and walkthrough is not even really a walkthrough. Walkthrough is really like a run through. <laughs> there were those games. Tennessee State. I mean, you're winning the game, and then all of a sudden the lights go out and the light come back on, you're losing the game. How does that happen? You know, we ride there on the bus, and you know, they don't even they only have hot water for you after the game. When you're talking HBCUs, you know, I think we were just we were barely one double A. We were almost division two. We were, we were. If it wasn't for if it wasn't for just, you know, us being so good as black college national champions, we you would not know it by the way we travel sometimes. I'm sure you had the same bad experiences, right? <laughs> I'm sure you've been on the bus before, right? I'm sure you took a bus to a game. Right? Maybe once. Bend your knees. Set, go. Punch. All right, so, so hold on. Let's talk about Coach Say. Um, what I, what I appreciate most about him is what you said. Like, he'll listen to his players. It's like, if you have something going on, like, you can go and talk to him. Yeah. You know? And he looked out for you. He was a, a defensive coordinator while we were at Cleveland under Bill Belichick. And when I first met him, he had major respect for him. No doubt about it. He just, you know, very I never got along with many coaches, but with Nick I did. I just remember I'm looking at this man. And, and you look at your coach and you always think, well, what kind of, I never heard of. So I'm thinking, well, what kind of credibility does this guy have? All right. Look, guys, backpedaling is the most overrated thing in playing in the secondary, in my opinion. And I used to teach him backpedal all the time, all right, until I got Everson Wall. Guy got 66 interceptions in the National Football League and cannot backpedal. Cannot backpedal. Yeah, yeah. Nah. He's, he's serious like, about his work. You do something wrong, he's gonna yell at you. Like, you do something right, he's gonna yell at you. Yeah, like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what, he just holds you to like this standard, you know? Yeah. You can tell like, he really loves, genuinely loves football. What about the decision to move you to uh, cornerback? I think you had said you, you didn't take it well at first. Yeah, I didn't take it well at first, but I feel like Coach Saban had saw some in me that I didn't, couldn't see in myself. I remember him speaking with Steph, obviously, because they both played the same position. And, you know, they had very different college experiences. At Maryland, they needed a wide receiver. At Alabama, they had tons of them. So it's like, do you stay behind four other guys and hope you get playing time? Or do you, you know, go to where the need is and you'll absolutely get playing time? So I think when Steph like broke it down in that type of like, just rational kind of decision making, she was like, you're right. I don't want to sit on the bench. Like, I'm just going to go learn corner. And he did it. <laughs> the thing that sets Trayvon apart from any other receiver that goes to play DB is ball skills. His ability to play the ball in the air is uncanny. I was like, who does, who does Coach say the think he is switching by side position? So I, I want to call him up. So I called him up. 
and he didn't answer it, and so I hung up. He called me back, and I checked it out, and I, I didn't even answer the phone. He was like, oh, this coach saved me, you know, give me a call. So I went to the game, and then after the game, I was like, um, do you think you can play that position? I said, I want him to come down here and switch position, and he's all over the place, and then he doesn't get good at any position. He said, he can play corner. I said, can he really play? He said, yes, he could be a good corner. Harris loads up and throws, and it's intercepted. You know, he just, I took it from there, but he seen something in me that I didn't see in myself, so. Man, led the nation. I thought I was gonna be the man. I led the nation. I was really just feeling so of myself. You know, like, man, they, they realized how talented I am, how I can really play man to man. You're looking at the floor of the Grand Ballroom of the Sheraton Hotel in New York City, where for the next eight and one half hours, history will be made. We start the 1981 National Football And so uh, I just knew they would know that. And by the time it came around, I wasn't drafted. Very disappointed. Before that first day was over, I had three teams coming up here with a free agent contract. I was extremely upset about that. That's the kind of things that, that went on back then with HBCU. And so not being drafted, you know, was when I came into camp, I was mad at everybody. Cowboys first round selection, Howard Richards. In those days, they had more than a hundred rookies come to rookie training camp. There were probably around 15 rookie defensive backs trying to make the cut to get to training camp. 15. I participated in a drill. Uh, that particular drill, I, I didn't do a good job on that drill. Gene Stallings felt that, you know, maybe I didn't get my all. So here he comes running right up to me. First drill, he comes running up to me, calls me a boy. And he just, just lays it on me and tells me I need to do better. Coach Stallings just, I mean, he, he got right here and just was berating him so bad. It was so serious that we thought Everson don't have a chance of making it. When they saw me get cursed out by Gene Stallings, Michael Downs and all the boys started taking bets. Okay. Stay off the yellow. Work on Jew. Keep this thing going now. Go, 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 um, me getting drafted, uh, second know, round. Yeah, second round. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to go first round. That's, you know. I'm you surprised you did. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just remember we had a, a draft party. Um, we had a draft party. We had we had a bunch of hats on the table, right? I had asked my son like, where do you think your dad gonna go? And he had picked up a Dallas hat. I thought I was gonna go first, but. You know, that didn't end up happening. With the third pick in the 2020 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Jeff Okuda, defensive back, Ohio State. A.J. Terrell, defensive back, Clemson. Damon Arnett. Noah Ipanogany. Jeff Gladney. Jalen Johnson. They just took so many corners before me in the first round. I was just like, there's no way. Y'all think that all these people here is better than me? And I just, I just always kept that like with me, you know? Hello. Yeah. Trevon? How you doing, Cook? I'm proud to tell you, because I'm proud of it too. Uh, you've got a star on your help, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that a lot. Well, I sure uh, I enjoyed our time, our interview, and uh, what we were most excited about is the improvement that you can make. Everybody, the word is he can get better. He can get better. So yes, you're going to have to go to work. But if you go to work, you'll get something. Okay? You can do it. Yes, sir. I got you, Coach. With the 51st pick in the 2020 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys select Trayvon Diggs, defensive back, Alabama. 
all my brother told me, he's just like, now he like, go get on the field. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it, that's simple as that. Like, that's all I want you to worry about. He's like, go get on the field. Like, no time to make, making friends, like, no time to be, you know, just BSing around, like, mm -hmm. take it like a business. Like, go get on the field. So, you know, I went into camp just with that mindset, like, I'm getting on the field. Like, I don't care. I'm getting on the field. Like, whatever I got to do, whatever I want to see, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get on the field. We talked about Trayvon Diggs, the cornerback out of Alabama, as a possible first-round pick. Lo and behold, the Cowboys get him with the 51st overall pick in the second round, and it seems to be working out quite well. I know he's a rookie. I just said he's a second-round pick, but he is making a legitimate case for starter caliber playing time. Lance back throwing deep to the post, and the ball's intercepted by Diggs. On second and long, a lot of time, another deep ball. He's got Metcalf, and he caught it at the 10. And it gets punched out That's by a Diggs touchback. How about Diggs? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be picked off. Diggs, he's been beat early in the season, but I think when you look at him, all his attributes, I mean, he has the makings of a really exceptional corner. The only difference with Trayvon's rookie season, I would say, because he was dealing with COVID. You know, the casual average fan doesn't really understand how hard it is for guys to make the transition from college. But they have to be thrown in the fire, you know, didn't run in the combine, no pro day, no preseason, no OTAs, not really getting a chance to be around your coaches, but virtually players. And then playing a the game where you really got to build relationships, you know, how do you respond to that? It wasn't so much that he couldn't play his rookie year, but it's now the game is slowing down and now he understands it more. And that's what all Trayvon ever needed. He could go through a drill, he may mess up the first time, but the second time, he always got it. That growth right there alone is the difference between freshman, I mean, rookie year and sophomore year to me. I think his mental maturation was uncanny that off season. You said you left some plays out there last year. Mm -hmm. Did you go back and watch the film after the season, or did you see what Definitely. Did you see I, I got my hands on 14 balls. Um, I ended up with not 14 interceptions, so that's a problem. But, you know, I'm this year I'm focused on, you know, making all those opportunities count. Anytime I touch the ball, you know, I want interceptions. It just seems to be the natural instinct of Hogs that when they see a Dallas Cowboys jersey, they want to tear it apart. I, my first regular season game, I got an interception. It was against the Redskins at the time. But uh, the Cowboys were blowing them out. We were blowing them out. We did a good job. And once they put me in the game, you know, it's, it's garbage time then. And so uh, I'm, wait I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. My defensive line, they flush out Joe Theismann, which is what you expect the doomsday defensive line to do. And he throws up a duck, and I'm, and I'm on it. And so once I intercepted, that's one of 11 that came that year. You would expect an absolutely electric atmosphere in a stadium where the team that lives there is celebrating a championship. They wanted it. They're going to be ready tonight. We'll find out, Brad Sham, if your Dallas Cowboys, as they come on the field to the booze of the Tampa crowd, are ready. On first down, <laughs> Brady play action, screen left, dropped, and intercepted off the hands of Fournette and picked out of the air by Trayvon Diggs. Now he's going to run in the end zone with all his defensive mates. I wouldn't necessarily say I got a favorite interception, but it do feel good. Uh, interceptions are something that you, you can necessarily uh, uh, teach somebody. Yeah. They kind of have to have that knack, you know, and maybe if they've shown it, then you can bring that out in them. But for the most part, they just don't have that mindset to think, you know, this is mine. I am the receiver when the ball is getting there. That's yeah, although the quarterback, they say the quarterback is not throwing you the ball, but when that ball is in the air, it's anybody. Bro. It's anybody, yeah. Avenon out of the shotgun, going deep. It'll be picked off by Emerson Walls. It's a pass picked off. It's Trayvon Diggs down the sideline. Nobody's going to catch.
catch him. House call. Trayvon Diggs pick six. Touchdown. Like I said, Dallas. mental health, man. Like he, he's as mentally strong as I, I know, especially on that field. I mean, you, you, you definitely have a have mindset to be out there and to take chances how he does and, and, and come up with the reward. I mean, because a lot of people want to play it safe. A lot of people want to uh, just do their job. But he's, he's looking to make that big play. Darnold back to throw, out to the left. It is broken up and intercepted by Diggs again. Diggs again. Diggs again. They're still throwing at me. We heard Trayvon say that last year. They're still throwing at me. Okay, come on, throw it at me. And I think Everson was very much the same way. Sims standing close to the line of scrimmage and throwing picked off by Everson Walls. That's that rookie's fourth interception already this year. I remember against the Los Angeles Rams Monday Night Football. Prime time for some reason, I, I would like get two a game. That's when they used to try to come at me. They had some stat out a few years ago. I had more. Uh, interceptions on Monday Night Football than anybody else. Play action by Hayden. Going deep is Drew Hills, the intended receiver. There's a battle in the end zone, and if you believe Emerson Walls, his sixth interception of this year, he has two tonight. When he knew he had a beat on the ball, there was an aura that I th swear I could see come over him. His entire body language changed as he tracked the ball, and you could tell that he was going to intercept it. And I said that last year on maybe one of Diggs's. It was remarkable. It was like deja vu. Glennon play action. Lots of time going deep. And he's got a man down the middle of the field. And the ball is intercepted by Diggs. There's his interception for the week. 30, 40, coming right. Take him down at the 40. You could tell Diggs was going to catch that ball when it was still 20 yards away. I guess the main problem with, with most DBs is the fear. Mm -hmm. You're scared to turn around. 100%. But I, I, I never looked at it as a, a fear to turn around. I looked at it as an opportunity soon coming. Yeah, I would say I'm a young professional ball player, young in, in uh, heart, but uh, not in spirit, because uh, I'm out there trying every play just like anyone else. And I think my statistics are proving that, you know, I can be as good as any professional ball player out there. I'm, I'm deflecting because they were coming at me. They were coming at me 15, 17 times a game because you got this slow guy from this small school, you know, not drafted, so we're going at him. Moves out on a wing. Take to Nathan. Intercepted by Wall. And he's to the 38 yard line. That's the seventh interception of the year for Walls, tying the Dallas rookie record. I was leading the league in interceptions before I started. I was leading the league in interceptions from the bench. And that's something that, you know, I don't think anybody's ever done. So far, the score's been pretty even. He catches a couple and they catch a couple. If I was drafted, I would have been starting by second game. But because I was a free agent, uh, I was feeling that disfavor within the organization. You know, maybe this is a fluke. You know, he catch some, they catch some. You know, and then finally, Coach Landry realized that maybe if I play him more, he'll get more interceptions. And so that's what he ended up doing. Eight, so. Absolutely, yeah. and a chance to prove himself. And the, the fact that the Patriots are two and three is really immaterial because the Cowboys have not won in New England since 1987. If you're 30 years old, you weren't alive. The atmosphere was crazy, you know, and they wasn't throwing the ball the whole game. And then finally they threw the ball and, you know, got an interception. So. Second and 15, Jones fires it over the middle, and there's Diggs with the deflected interception left sideline. But but you watch him, and it wasn't just catch the ball and get on the ground. You know, he was catching the ball and taking it to the house, catching the ball and making plays and different things like that. So you just continue to watch him, uh, and, and it was amazing. It, it was like here here it goes again. It, it, there's Trayvon Diggs again, and 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 it's you know people continue to challenge him to a certain extent, but he continued to make plays. Uh, 
you know, you're going against people 10 years older than you sometimes. Yeah. You're playing against quarterbacks even older than that. And so they think they have their experience on you. And I look even further. Look at all the, 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 the defensive coordinators, or offensive coordinators that knew they had your number. You know, and we're going to outthink this guy. To me, I took more pride in that fight because that's a mental fight here. Physically, I can whip some, somebody on the field, but mentally, I'm not just going against this wide receiver quarterback. I'm going against their entire offensive team, their entire offensive coaching staff. And you, you tried to outsmart me, but no, I outsmarted you. The tight end in motion to the right. Heineke with play action, wants to throw on first down, deep to the right, throw and it digs, digs, intercepted it at the 30-yard line. There's number 11. That is a new Cowboy interception record. The football 49ers stand just two steps away from a Super Bowl title. Their hurdle today is more than formidable. The Dallas Cowboys. A team whose tradition is as rich as San Francisco's is barren. Dallas this afternoon seeks a record sixth trip to the Super Bowl. And what are the fans here at Candlestick Park? Are they ready? We were considered to be the favorites to go to the Super Bowl that year, even with the young defensive backs that we had. Uh, then you got this upstart team on the bay. The young coach who has brought the San Francisco 49ers literally from nowhere. This is a great matchup. I, I think it's one of the most exciting championship games you're going to see in a long time. That's including what you've seen these past years. And uh, so here we are, man, battling out. And one thing that, that the Cowboys did not expect, that offensively we would be handled. They probably felt a bit defeated after I got my second interception in that game. Montana setting up the throw deep, throws it high, down in the corner, Emerson Walls takes it away from Freddie Solomon. We're feeling good. I mean, we're feeling good. That was one of the few times I really celebrated after I got an interception because I thought that was it. We clinched it on these boys because we were up by six points. Everson Walls, the brilliant rookie out of Grambling. It seemed like the league picked on him in the early going, but he has made them pay the price. 11 interceptions during the year and two more today. Well, the offense didn't do anything with the ball. And here it is, uh, Montana and the Niners, Bill Walsh. You know, they've got uh, one last drive in them. And boy, I, I got to admit, they outcoached us. had been preparing for a particular play that they run all the time on goal line. It's a pick play for Freddie Solomon. Uh, Dennis Thurman played it perfectly because Dennis is smart and Dennis was there, he anticipated. So now Joe has to, has to retreat because his number one option is not there. And when he lofted it up there into the end zone, I thought it was going out of bounds. I was standing on the sideline. Joe Montana was running right at me, and so he heaved the ball up, and you'll never convince me he wasn't just throwing it away. I think I had the best view. He wasn't throwing it away. They're six yards away from Pontiac. Third and three. We'll see a pickup sometime on the right side, possibly. Montana looking, looking, throwing in the end zone.
Dwight saw the ball when it was released. I never saw the release. So I couldn't understand the trajectory. And so he was able to reach up and make the play. And, and you know, I was, man, I was right there. I thought I was going out the back of the end zone. I had all the confidence in the world that we were going to drive back down there and make a play. I really did. Danny White brought them back down the field. And he threw a pass to Drew Pearson at midfield. And Drew was pulling away. And I think it was Eric Wright, the defensive back, who got like a fingernail on Drew's jersey and kept him from breaking away and scoring. And I think it was on the next play that Dwayne Board sacked Danny White and he fumbled and then the game was over. And did Stuckey get it? Yes, Jim Stuckey got it. And the shame of it is, you know, it's a shame of it because everybody remembers Everson for the play, the catch. You know, he covered that guy a long time, okay? Where was the pass rush, okay? People forget all of that. They just, they focus on that catch and it really overshadowed the type of year he has and the type of play he was. And Dallas 27, but San Francisco 28. And the Ironically, the best games I ever played in. Uh, had about like three turnovers. We end up losing, but uh, that is eerie how both of our games ended up uh, ending. And, and when I say games, I mean a really good season that we were having. Yeah. And we were all, we were in control uh, until we weren't. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that was very disappointing. And you guys had that same problem. Babe Laubenberg, there, I submit, there is no greater playoff rivalry for this first round, this wild card round, anywhere in the league than Dallas, San Francisco. Two great championship games in the early 70s. The catch, three consecutive championship games in the middle 90s. Such great tradition. So many memories. Four-man rush, he throws it out, intercepts. Mitchell in motion and hands the ball off to Samuel coming around to the right side. They block it up, 20, 15, 10, streaking in. Debo Samuel, touchdown San Francisco. Snap on third down, looking right. Under pressure, good block from Martin. He strolls left, he runs in. Touchdown, Prescott. And two, play fake, boots to the left. Throws it out to Kittle short. And Diggs can't tackle. Ball fumble! Gone. Fumble on the sideline. Dallas has the football. Diggs knocked it loose from Kittle, and Donovan Wilson recovered. Ruling on the field after discussion, it's an incomplete pass. Oh. Please accept the game clock at 436. It'll be third down. And sure the did. crowd doesn't like it, but as we see the replay, babe, that's 100% yeah. the right call. 14 seconds left. Here we go. Down by six. Second and one at the Niner 41. 49 is going to play those sideline routes to not let you get out of bounds. Prescott in the gun, runs up the middle to the 30, to the 25 and slides. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Did he spike it in time? They haven't, they haven't said anything official. That's the end of the game. Oh, wow. There you go. Some foolishness went on at the end of the game. <laughs> you mean the timing of the the clock and the referees and all of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one thing Saban used to say as well. He used to say, like, don't even leave it in the ref's hands. Like, take it out of the ref's hands. Right. Make it so far away. Like, the score is so far away that it's like the rest can't do nothing about it, mm -hmm. you know? So just us being in that situation, us being that close to them, you know, we let that, that got to that point and we let that happen. And we got a taste of that playoff feeling, you know? So we kind of know what to expect next time. You know, we know what type of mindset to go in, you know, what type of energy we need mm -hmm. to bring. And I feel like, you know, it's, we, got, we got a taste of it, you know? So we want that back. It, ha it has been a bit weird. Uh, when Trayvon started making all these picks, uh, I got a couple of phone calls, you know, from former coaches and, and teammates uh, almost apologizing for not uh, being more appreciative. I didn't realize that I needed that apology. All of a sudden, I started feeling better. I, I, and I never, ever saw that come. 
this happen? I knew it was going to happen. I, when I saw the ball in the air, I was already up with my, my hands in the air. I knew that was going to be it. And you're going to tell me that didn't look like an Everson Walls in the second? No, it did. Come on, man. Here, boy. He is. You can just see him playing differently. And I, I, I tweeted out when he did the pick six. And I, I've always said the interceptions are contagious. Well, when he when he caught it, I remember standing up like that is, you know what I mean? I had my hand, I mean, I had my fist up like I was mine, like I got the interception. So we're we're up there, everybody's going crazy in there. Digs with ten, meaning only three guys in this organization have had double-digit interceptions: Diggs, Renfro, and Everson Walls. Walls. That's it. Uh, Everson Walls was Trayvon Diggs' biggest cheerleader. He wanted him to break the record and he ended up tying it, but he wanted him to get there. He, he thought that, you know, he carried that mantle forever. I can always have mine, you know, and I've always had my moments. Yeah. I've had my moment for 40 years, for 40 years. Yeah. I'll still have that rookie record. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, he can't take my rookie <laughs> record. It's too late, yeah. you know? So that can always stand. That's an NFL record, yeah. you know? And so you appreciate how you know, good that record is and how long it may stand. Um, Saban, he say, don't chase records, don't chase accolades. You do what you do on the field, it's gonna come. That's right. So I just try to just focus on just one play at a time. Uh, if, you, if it's that easy, why didn't let somebody else do it? Well, nobody, nobody's done that in 40 years. Yeah. I mean, just think about that. It's you did that. You did that. It may not be an NFL record, but when you start talking about franchise records, man, welcome to the club, brother. Because you're looking at, you know, you might not know about Mel Renfro, but Mel Renfro was Dion before Dion. Yeah. And so the fact that somebody like me was able to do that, you know, and then for that to stand for 40 years and then you do it, you know, where were all those other guys that were supposed to be so good at, at doing this? Yeah. You know, that now the only, the only two are standing right now are me and you, yeah. and that's it. Shut on because that's my boy. <laughs> nah, but honestly, yeah, that was amazing what he did. You know, just 11 interceptions. So, and I like to pay homage to you know the greats. So, that's why I wear it.